What type of strength and stamina and mental tenacity does it take to win the grandest of gravel races with the highest caliber of competition? Today I'm going to analyze power data as well as training and fueling strategies and some gear choices employed by the top finishers of Unbound Gravel this year. So if you're curious about what it really takes to get to the front, stay there and claim victory at the finish, you've clicked on the right video. If you're new to this channel, I'm Alan, aka Dirty Teeth, nice to meet you. And if you've been here before, welcome back, it's great to see you. This year, Lachlan Morton was part of a trio that gained and maintained a couple minute gap from the chase group. He eventually won the 200 mile elite men's race in stellar fashion by outkicking the hard charging Chad Haga during a gutsy sprint in the final 500 meters. Coincidentally, on the same day he won Unbound, I released a video dissecting Lachlan's power data and all the minutia of his blazing fast ride on the Tour Divide route last year. Some of you asked for a similar deep dive into Unbound and I thought it would be fun, so here we are. On the women's side, a top-notch pack of riders took control of the race early on. Lauren De Crescenzo rode off the front at mile 80. She impressively built a three-minute gap, but was eventually reeled in by the chasers at mile 125. At that point, the lead group, although still intact, had whittled itself down to 11, including LDC. By the end, two more dropped off, and the nine remaining ladies poured it all out for a super exciting sprint finish. When the dust settled, Newcomer and unbound rookie Rosa Closer surprised the masses, and probably herself a little bit too, when she powered ahead of the others and landed on the top step of the podium. Both Lachlan and Rosa now hold new course records along with their wins, and by all accounts, this was the fastest unbound ever. One could easily assume that both of them had perfectly executed clean runs, free of mechanicals and tactical errors, but far from it actually. Lachlan bravely attacked Solo into a headwind around mile 70 and grew a gap of about a minute 20 to the chase group over the next 30 miles. He then lost it all when he made a wrong turn and wound up right back with the group he worked so hard to ditch. Rosa crashed and punctured her front tire around mile 131. Luckily, she chose to ride with inserts and was somehow able to keep up with the lead women for a while with only about 8 to 10 psi in the tire. But it was a struggle and she eventually stopped to try to blast some CO2, but nada, and she lost the lead group. Eventually, after 17 miles, she limped into the final feed zone where her sponsor Envy promptly replaced her wheel and tire. Even with all the drama, she only gave up two minutes to the lead group and wound up chasing all the way back to join them with about 20 to 30 miles still to go. And she still had enough in the tank to out sprint the other eight ladies for the win. Talk about grit. I promise I'll dive into all the details, but first some housekeeping. I nerded out by reaching out to athletes directly, watching all the videos and reading all the articles and listening to all the podcasts and digging through all the Strava files. I strive for accuracy, but if I make any errors, please let me know in the comments. Also, my list of sources and media credits are in the description, and there's a zillion of them. So if I messed something up or forgot an attribution, I'm very sorry. Please let me know so I can remedy it. And there's going to be a ton of info crammed into this one, so I'll also include chapter markers in the description as well, so you can jump around and refer back later. For those of you wondering what's this mythical unbound I speak of, it started as the homegrown Dirty Kansas 200 race back in 2006. It takes place in Emporia, Kansas, and was inspired by the Trans-Iowa race. A mere 34 adventurous souls towed the line at the first edition, and only 15 finished. Maybe that's because the route is roughly 200 miles, with close to 12,000 feet of climbing up and down the back roads of the notorious Flint Hills. Dan Hughes took the overall win in 2006 with an impressive time of 12 hours and 58 minutes, and there were zero female finishers in that inaugural race. Jump forward 18 years till now, and it's evolved into the premier gravel racing event in the world. The 200 mile elite race remains the creme de la creme, attracting powerhouse pros from all over and plenty of media fanfare. However, 25, 50, and 100 mile options were added to the roster in 2013. And in 2018, they went even bigger and threw in the 350 mile XL route into the mix. Also in 2018, Lifetime Fitness purchased the Dirty Kanza, and by then, it had already increased exponentially to 2,500 registered riders. 
The original event name paid homage to the Kaw Nation, also known as the Kanza, and the Kanza Prairie Lands that the route travels through. But there were concerns that the dirty Kanza was inadvertently disrespectful, so in 2020, Lifetime decided to change the name to Unbound Gravel. This year, the rider count ballooned to nearly 5,000 participants from 28 countries. Categories now include paracycling, and every year, female representation grows. This year had almost 1,000 women riders. The elite 200-mile races had 202 participants. The men had 142 starters, and the women had 60. As far as the course goes, there's a north and a south route, which they switch between every couple of years. The northern route was on tap this year, and it's a bit hillier, with more rollers, and considered to be technically more demanding. Although the southern course tends to get more swampy and susceptible to long sections of mud when it rains, which it tends to do a lot at Unbound. 2022 and 2023 were raced on the southern route, and this was the first time the northern route had been used since 2021. In addition to being a standalone gravel race, the Unbound 200 Elite categories are also the second stop of the seven races in the Lifetime Grand Prix which is a gravel and mountain bike series showcasing 30 of the top male and 30 of the top female professional off-road racers from all over. Lifetime now streams live Instagram coverage of Grand Prix events, as well as extended race highlights two days after. The production value is fantastic. Then when the race season is done and dusted and it's time to get us amped up again for next season, they release Call of a Lifetime, which is basically gravel racing's answer to Netflix's Drive to Survive, or Tour de France Unchained. It's easily bingeable and has helped me through many tough trainer rides. I'll link to the YouTube channel below. Okay, okay, let's get to the meat. Lachlan Morton's first ever gravel race was actually unbound in 2019, where he crossed the finish line with his buddy and then EF Pro Cycling teammate, Alex House. They rolled in together, basically tied for third, although Lachlan technically took fourth with a time of 10 hours, 18 minutes, and 47 seconds. In 2022, he crashed hard, snapping off his DI2 box, forcing him to single speed until he got a puncture and decided to abandon. He returned in 2023, placing third after being beaten by Keegan Swenson and Peter Vakoch to the line among a sea of amateur racers finishing at the same time. His time was 10 hours, 6 minutes, and 5 seconds. The fourth time is the charm, as Lachlan came into this year with Unbound as his priority race for the season and his sights set firmly on winning. And that he did while setting a new course record of 9 hours, 11 minutes, and 47 seconds. This was well over an hour faster than his 2019 time and almost an hour faster than last year. Morton comes off as this laid back guy and is usually the dude brushing off the marginal gain stuff. But he definitely went for some aero advantages this year. He was rocking Pac's new Pro Air helmet, featuring an integrated visor and ear covers. He also had Rafa Aero socks, and he was sporting Rafa's new Blero skin suit that has an integrated bladder pouch, which I'll touch on more in a minute. On the other hand, he did have a wooden paint stir slash mud clearing stick dangling out of his pocket for the whole race. On it, he scribbled some route and feed zone mileages in a black Sharpie. And he did opt for a PBR at the finish line instead of some kind of sponsor-driven recovery drink, so there's that. Rosa Closer is currently a full-time PhD student attending business school in Copenhagen, Denmark, where she also teaches economics. She's the second German female to win Unbound in as many years. Her countrymate Carolyn Schiff took the top step last year. As unbelievable as it sounds, Rosa only started cycling three years ago. She began road racing part-time two years ago and dipped her toes into gravel last year. A month before Unbound, she took third place at the prestigious Troca 200K in Girona, Spain. Even so, this was Closer's first time at Unbound and her first race in the US, period. So she was pretty much flying under the radar, but definitely not anymore. In the days after Unbound, Rosa flew to Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, where she was presenting research at a four-day conference. No rest for the wicked. Closer's winning time of 10 hours, 26 minutes, and two seconds was also a new course record. This narrowly bested Sofia Gomez Villafanye's time of 10 hours, 27 minutes, and 40 seconds set in 2022, and that year second place Lauren Di Crescenzo was nine minutes back. To demonstrate how strong the women were this year, the next seven female finishers came in within two seconds after Closer. 
and a total of nine women beat Sophia's previous course record. They were flying. So how does a full-time student with a job train for Unbound? Or how about the rest of the elite riders at Unbound? I was curious myself, so I did some digging. As you might have guessed, for a 10-hour race, everybody's cranking up the volume. Although what's considered high volume varies between riders. And there's still plenty of hard threshold and VO2 efforts and intervals sprinkled in. After all, you've got to ensure you make the selections and have the gusto to attack and go with others' attacks and counterattack. And since sprint finishes are becoming the new norm, you sure don't want to neglect your top end too much. As far as tapering goes, pretty much everybody seemed to use the days leading up to rid themselves of fatigue, do some specific tuning, and course reconnaissance rides. As for time crunched Rosa Closer, her unbound prep was done primarily via Zwift racing on an indoor trainer. Most of her workouts are executed at night after a long day of school and work, and she has to be very efficient and specific with her sessions. During lower intensity rides, she'll actually multitask by prepping for lectures and handling other stuff. As Unbound approached, she alternated between volume and intensity and somehow managed to sneak in 15 to 20 hours of training per week. A few other notable female training stats are as follows. Lauren de Crescenzo was on the higher end of the volume spectrum with 28 and a half and 26 and a half hour weeks leading up to Unbound. Hannah Otto completed a 28 hour week and a 21 hour week with 26K average of climbing per week and a longest ride of about eight hours. Sarah Sturm averaged 18 hours and 18,000 feet of climbing per week with a long ride of six and a half hours. But she did do the Troca 360 at the beginning of May, so I guess you can consider that a 13 hour training ride for Unbound. I also want to mention Paige Onweller, who had surgery to repair a torn ligament in her ankle just 12 weeks before the race. She was completely off the bike from three weeks before the surgery to three weeks after, and then blasted through rehab and got third place. If that's not impressive, I don't know what is. As far as the men go, Lachlan came in with some massive volume under his belt. In the three weeks leading up, he was averaging 31 to 32 hours with 50,000 feet of climbing per week. His longest training ride was about nine hours. After a long hiatus from formal training, Lachlan started working with coach Dennis Van Winden a year and a half ago. They seem to have struck a nice balance between training rides that Lachlan can enjoy and stay motivated for, while still slipping in enough structure and intervals to ensure he's in top form. Lachlan himself is not really data driven and he rides mostly on feel, leaving all the number crunching to Dennis. He also stresses the importance of fun in a training routine. Some athletes like regimented structure and get joy out of quantifying progress with data and he's not knocking that. But he champions the idea of molding training to your riding style, not the other way around. Anyway, if you think that's a lot of volume, think again. Keegan Swenson was riding a mind-boggling 35 to 40 hours per week during his unbound training block in Tucson, Arizona. Basically, eat, ride, eat, sleep, and do it all over again. Much of this was performed in 90 to 100 degree temps, so he was definitely getting heat adaptations and increased plasma volume. He'd do big back-to-back -back days in a row, often expending five to 7,000 kilojoules per ride. He also had at least one massive 10-hour day. For that effort, he drank a liter of water beforehand, 11 liters during, and three liters afterwards to aid in recovery. This seems superhuman to most of us, and even most pros wouldn't respond positively to that much training stress. And they'd most likely wind up overtrained. But Keegan's proven time and again, he's a special kind of special. Russell Finsterwald served as Keegan's training partner for the camp, and Matt Beers joined them for some fun as well. On a side note, those three, along with a few others, wound up doing a bunch of the work at the front of the chase group, and unfortunately, Keegan crossed wheels with Finsty and crashed late in the race. Otherwise, it would have been cool to see if they could have hunted down Haga and Morton. Another notable rider is Greg Van Avermaet, who won Olympic road race gold in Rio, multiple stages on the Tour de France, and countless other accolades. He said he was training around 20 hours a week, which was close to what he'd do in his pro world tour days. Chad Haga, who took second place just behind Lachlan Morton, was also in the 20-ish hours per week range with 20-ish thousand feet of climbing per week. Haga also did specific heat tolerance training and focused on raising his maximum sweat rate. 
He measured his sweat rate at over two liters per hour leading into unbound. That equates to two kilos or 4.4 pounds of body weight lost in sweat every hour. Think about that for a sec. Peter Havoc, who finished fourth, also did six weeks of heat prep to help him understand how much fluid he'd need to take in based on his estimated sweat rate in the Kansas heat. In addition to time on the bike and heat training, there's a few other training elements I want to briefly touch on. Strength and conditioning sessions a couple times a week are definitely the norm, and a premium is put on getting as much recovery and sleep as possible. Beyond this, many of the elite athletes are working with sports psychologists and incorporating visualization exercises. I guess this is a smooth segue to hydration and fueling, but before that, I want to go through some power output and other ride stats. I always find these metrics super fascinating, and this time I'll start with some of the more interesting finds from the men's race. First up is South African Matt Beers, three-time winner of the Cape Epic. He finished 13th at Unbound, five minutes after Lachlan. At 6'4 and 180 pounds, he's one of, if not the biggest, strongest rider in the Lifetime Grand Prix, and he's got the power output to prove it. He maintains a power to weight ratio around six watts per kilo, with an FTP around 480 to 490 watts. All in all, he held an average power of 298 watts and a normalized power of 348 watts throughout his nine hours and 16 minute effort. What's impressive to me is his maximum three hour power of 306 is only eight watts higher than what he averaged for the whole shebang. Talk about Steady Eddie. If you're curious, he burned through a whopping 9,858 kilojoules with that effort, or an average of 1,071 kilojoules per hour. Pfft, that's insane. Now let's take a look at Chad Haga, who as we know was just edged out by Lachlan and took second place. He's also a big guy at six foot three, but he only weighs 159 pounds, so 21 pounds lighter than Matt Beers. His average power was 267 with a normalized power of 307. But even with an average power 31 watts lower than Beers, his power to weight ratio was actually higher. Haga's average watt kg was 3.7 versus the 3.64 of Beers. And he expended 9,015 kilojoules. So he burned about 800 less calories than Beers while riding five minutes faster. For what it's worth, Chad Haga, with a background in road racing, kept an average cadence of 87, while Beers, who's more of a pure mountain biker, averaged 77 RPMs. In this day and age where data tracking and power meters reign supreme, Lachlan Morton was probably the only pro that rode without one for Unbound. He didn't even wear a heart rate strap and just rode old school off of Instinct and the good old built-in heart rate monitor. Again, it's not like he recorded data to go over later with his coach or humble brag on Strava and just didn't display it on his head unit. He straight up didn't use the tech at all. And as much as I'd love to scope his impressive numbers, I'm even more impressed that he didn't bother to record them. On a side note, I do find it pretty amusing that Lachlan rode with a power meter on his 2700 mile time trial of the Tour Divide, but he relied on perceived effort at Unbound. What a G. Anywho, I've got some more stats and insights from a few more of the top finishers, but instead of boring you by spouting off all the numbers, I made a chart. So if you want to do some comparisons, go ahead and press pause now. Just messing around. Go ahead and press pause now and have a gander. <laughs> I was curious how the efforts this year compared to Keegan Swenson's win last year, so I threw his 2023 numbers at the bottom of the chart for funsies. His average power of 271 with a whopping 4.23 watt kg definitely jumps off the screen at you. And he held that during a race that took almost an hour longer than this year. Oh, and fifth place finisher Mattia DiMarchi's power meter recorded that he spent 86% of the race pedaling versus only 14% coasting. I thought that was a fun stat worth sharing. One final stat for the men before I jump over to the women. During the final sprint, Chad Haga hit 802 watts as he came around Lachlan, and he averaged 557 watts from there all the way to the line. And Lachlan was still able to come back around Haga decisively for the win. Pew, mic drop. On the women's side, I don't have Rosa Closer's power file, but she said she was up near 700 watts on the final sprint when she pulled away for the win. And watching that acceleration, I don't doubt it. For reference, the only other top female I could find with a burst of power anywhere close to that was Hannah Otto, 
who had a five second max power of 662 watts. But that was only 45 minutes into the race, not after 10 hours. Otto did try an attack on the final short climb nearing the finish. During this last ditch effort to get some separation before the inevitable mass sprint, she eked out an average of 400 watts for 47 seconds. At her weight, that's an extremely impressive 7.34 watt kg effort. And guess what? Everyone stayed on her wheel at speeds around 20 miles an hour. When the sprint ensued and after gutting herself on the climb, Otto still mustered a 611 watt max. Heather Jackson, who placed fifth, peaked at 521 watts, but sustained at around 417 during the final 500 meters. Carolyn Schiff peaked at 557, but couldn't sustain quite as well as Heather Jackson and took home sixth. Anywho, I couldn't find power files for the first through fourth place women. Regardless, I made this chart with the data I could piece together, so click pause if you want to take a sec to study that some more. So how do these elite athletes churn out all that wattage for so many hours without hitting the wall? Oh, hello. Hi. I've got one word for you, carbs, and lots of them. At the pointy end of the race, pretty much everyone's goal was to consume around 110 to 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour to keep the glycogen stores from getting completely depleted. That means consuming an average of 440 to 480 calories per hour for nine to 10 hours. Ah, my intestines are hurting just thinking about it. I probably should have mentioned it while discussing training, but getting your gut used to taking in that many calories without revolting is a thing, and it can't be taken lightly. Other than maybe a quick bite of something solid at a checkpoint, most were getting calories through a combo of gels and high carb mix in their water. Here's some stats from some of the top riders. Lachlan Morton's goal was to consume 100 to 120 grams of carbs per hour, and he wound up taking in an average of 104 grams per hour. He used Omax products, and they're the nutrition sponsors of Team EF. He started the day by carrying 440 grams of carbs in his pockets. At the end of the first feed zone, he grabbed another 470 grams of carbs. And at the second feed zone at mile 148, he grabbed an extra 310 grams to carry him through to the finish. Chad Haga aimed for 130 grams an hour. He weighs about 22 pounds more than Lachlan, so he was definitely pumping out more wattage and burning more calories. He used mostly a half and half combo of gels and carb mix from Never Second. He also had one of their Rice Krispie bars and a few handfuls of gummy bears. He also drank about 12 liters of fluids throughout the race. That's about 26 pounds or almost 12 kilos of water. Fourth place male, Piotr Havik, consumed 119 grams of carbs per hour via precision hydration and fueling products. His go-to were PF30 gels, PF30 chews, and their carb-only drink mix. Peter drank an average of 956 milliliters, or almost a liter of liquid per hour. Through sweat testing, he knows he loses 921 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat, so he also added a couple 500 milligram sodium tabs to every liter of water to keep his electrolytes replenished. Payson McKelvin aimed for 110 grams of carbs per hour via Martin gels and hydration mix. Female winner Rosa Closer was going for 120 grams of carbs per hour, and she chose carb mix, gels, and slushy ice gels from her nutrition sponsor, Ministry out of Germany. Sarah Sturm used a mixture of Never Second gels, Spring Energy gels, and Flow Formula carb mix to hit her magic number of 110 grams of carbs per hour. And by the last 50 miles, she switched primarily to plain water and gels. Hannah Otto's detailed fueling plan goes like this. She started carbo-loading three days out, and she had over 1,000 calories for breakfast at 3.30 a.m. on the morning of the race. This consisted of chocolate chip pancakes, Greek yogurt, and orange juice. During the race, she consumed about 115 grams of carbs per hour via first endurance liquid shot gels and high carb mix, and she drank about nine liters of fluids. There's definitely some consistency to these fueling strategies among the top riders, but one outlier was Haley Smith. During her lead up to Unbound, she'd been having some breathing issues and impaired gut function while training. So during the race, she chose to go with 50 to 60 grams of carbs per hour, so basically half of what everyone else was doing. And by the way, this used to be considered high carb until people started pushing the envelope more and more in what's considered the carb revolution over the last couple years. 
Haley used 6 dehydration and first endurance high carb mix, but not at full potency. She had fructose free first endurance gels, which are easier for her stomach, along with NAC Ultra and some untapped maple syrup and a couple Martin solids. And she ate a grilled cheese sandwich at Feed Zone 1. To be clear, Smith is not promoting her underfueling as a performance strategy, and she would have loved to consume more calories if her body allowed her to. But with all that aside, she still managed a super impressive fourth place finish, and Haley, I hope you get your breathing and gut issues handled soon. Anywho, traveling 70 and then 78 miles between aid stations means needing a lot of water carrying capacity. The best way to carry said water is always a consideration. Over the last few years, in addition to bigger one liter water bottles, we've seen lightweight hydration packs from the likes of Usue, Camelback, and Osprey becoming popular. This year was no different with various bottle and pack combos being used by most. But some riders were taking it further by ditching the vests altogether and opting for integrated bladder sleeves in their jerseys and skin suits. This shaves some weight, offers a slight aero advantage, and isn't nearly as hot as having a full pack on your back. I have a feeling by this time next year, you'll be hard pressed to find an antiquated hydration vest at the front of the pro field at Unbound. Castelli released the unlimited pro gravel jersey that can fit a one and a half liter reservoir, and I'm sure more brands will be following suit. Speaking of suits, Dylan Johnson wore the new gravel skin suit from Rule 28. It's marketed to fit a one and a half liter bladder, but he shoved a three liter bladder in his for Unbound. Another skin suit that was getting a lot of buzz at Unbound is the Rafa Blero suit. Yep, the name is a mashup of bladder aero suit. After initially being instigated by Keegan Swenson, other Rafa athletes like Lachlan Morton and Ellen Campbell had some say in the design and Sarah Sturm was wearing one as well. It can fit a two liter bladder and has pouches on the rear panels of the sleeves and legs to shove extra gels in. Lachlan received his Blero suit just a couple days before Unbound. He only had some bigger three liter bladders from bikepacking adventures, which didn't really fit in the bladder sleeve to his liking, and he didn't want to be tweaking too much so close to the race. In 2023, Lachlan stuffed a bladder in the front of his jersey because he forgot to bring a second hydration vest to Kansas. By doing this, he realized he actually likes putting the bladder on his belly with a snug jersey, so he did it again this year, even though he was rocking this special suit with an integrated bladder sleeve on the back. By the way, Dylan Johnson, Torbjorn, and Mate Mahorich all carried water bottles in the front of their jerseys, and according to Johnson's video, it's wind tunnel approved. So if you see pics of these guys with their pooched out bellies, it's not just super efficient diaphragm breathing. Lachlan froze the bladder he grabbed at the feed zone. This helped keep his core temperature down, and his body heat melted the water at a similar pace to his drinking rate, so he had good cold water for a long while. And by the way, stopping at feed zones is slowly becoming a thing of the past. There used to be this unwritten code that the lead groups would slow roll and wait for each other before dropping the hammer. But now, folks are strategically attacking in the pits. It's become so cutthroat that riders are just grabbing musette bags or hot swapping bottles and vests on the go. And if they have to stop, they're trying to change wheels or pump up tires and loop chains and scarf a few bites of food in 15 to 30 seconds max. It's seriously starting to look like a Formula One race on pit row. However you feel about it, this is the current spirit of gravel. And this wouldn't be a true dirty teeth video if I didn't geek out a little bit more on gear. So let's talk tires. Flint Hills gravel is sharp and unforgiving and chonky in sections, but the roads are smooth as butter in others. And mud is always a concern, so tire selection is pretty tricky. The perfect unicorn tire is one that's light and fast, grippy, and sheds mud well. All while having a durable casing with ample puncture protection. And we've got to remember the ideal tire is so specific and subjective with factors like rim width, rim depth, tire pressure, rider weight, riding style, and so on and so on, informing your choices as well. The current trend, which I foresee is continuing as frames and forks allow for more and more clearance, is to go with wider tires. Along with the higher volume, we'll see riders continue to experiment with lower pressures, just as has happened at the cross country World Cup level over the past few years. For gravel, 40s were considered fat not too long ago. And this year, the skinniest tires I saw on the pros bikes were 42s. 
Sarah Sturm and Lance Heidet were rocking specialized Pathfinder Pro 42s, while Heather Jackson and Pete Stetna were on IRC Boken Plus 42s. Ted King was on Rene Hurst, Snoqualmie Pass 44 Slicks with the Endurance Casing. Hannah Otto was rocking a 45C Kenda prototype, and Maxis Reaver 45s were also popular with top riders this year. Alexis Scarda, Haley Smith, and Chad Haga were all rocking them. Rosa Closer chose Continental Terra Speed 45s, while Keegan Swenson and Tobin Ortenblad opted for Maxis Rambler 50s with Silk Shield. By the way, that reminds me if you haven't watched Wingman, give it a look see. It's a fun glimpse into the relationship of Keegan and Tobin and their team dynamics. Tobin is pretty much the goose to Keegan's Maverick. Good times and the links below. Back to tires, take this for what it's worth. Lachlan and the next two lifetime Grand Prix finishers, Payson McKelvin in eighth and Dylan Johnson in 10th were all wearing mountain bike sized tires of some sort. Lachlan chose a Vittoria Torino Dry 2.1 in the front but with limited frame clearance could only manage a 44 millimeter Vittoria Mescal in the rear. Both of these were the absolute widest he could squeeze into his Cannondale Super 6 Evo frame and fork and left him virtually no room at all for mud clearance. Payson chose Max and Aspen ST 2.25s and Dylan Johnson went with my personal favorite 2.2 inch Continental Race Kings. If you're not already familiar with Dylan, he's a nerdy YouTuber with a channel way more interesting than mine. He has a cool video devoted to his wind tunnel optimized bike setup for Unbound and he reminds me of the way my dog obsessively licks a tuna can way after there's absolutely nothing left. In addition to the mountain bike tires, Johnson only inflated them to 18 psi in the front and 19 in the rear and had the most impressive race of his career. Some racers like Lance Hydette are still inflating their tires to the mid 30s, to each his own. But even roadies like Ted King who's a big dude has lowered his pressure down to the high 20s. Purely anecdotal, but a while back I eased off my tire pressure and started noticing faster times on my local loops. Not to mention increased traction and overall ride comfort, just saying. How about suspension? Most riders are still on fully rigid bikes at Unbound, but times they are a changing. More and more riders are opting for some type of relief from the fatigue inducing chatter and chunder. For some, this means a suspension stem or seat post to take the curse off. This year, Santa Cruz Hit Squad riders, Keegan Tobin and Alexis Scarta were all sporting RockShox Rudy suspension forks. Dylan Johnson opted for a Lauf leaf spring fork. Some of the specialized riders were on Diverge STR bikes with future shock suspension front and rear. I think we'll see more folks following suit in the future, opting to take a little bit of a weight penalty to keep from getting beat up so much, especially in the 200 and XL races. The pro field is still split between 1x and 2x drivetrains. For example, Lachlan was running a 2x while Chad Haga was on a 1x. Both setups are definitely capable of delivering the gearing necessary for Unbound. So it seems to be mostly dependent on who the riders are sponsored by. I'm not going to riff on which I think is better, there's good arguments for both, you can drop your opinions in the comments. Rosa Closer rode a SRAM 1x12 transmission with a 48 tooth front chain ring which is bigger than many of the men were pushing. Lachlan Morton channeled his inner Tade Pogaccia and switched out to shorter 165mm cranks for Unbound. It's also crazy to me how Lachlan slams his saddle so far forward and tips it down so much. He says it alleviates back pain, so who am I to judge? The top plate on his seat post wouldn't let him push the seat far enough forward, so he actually switched it out for a smaller one off a reverb so he could get a few more millimeters out of it. Finally, the talk of the paddock was a yet to be released SRAM Axis Explore 1x13 speed drivetrain that was spotted on more than a few bikes. Most notably, Keegan Swenson, an F1 racer turned off season gravelero, Valtteri Bottas. With the popularity and simplicity of 1x and an extra cog to smooth the jumps between gears, I expect this drivetrain to soar in popularity once it's released to the masses, which I'd imagine will be any day now. Let's talk about weather for a sec and how it contributed to the super fast conditions and record breaking times. Because no matter how fit and well trained you are, if you're pedaling in soppy rain or soaring heat, it's going to slow you down. Not to mention shouldering or pushing your bike through drivetrain destroying peanut butter mud. Rain fell earlier in the week, but never too much and it dried up pretty well. Also in the days leading up, 
There were more folks than ever pre-riding sections of the route, which meant more support vehicles driving on the course as well. As Amanda Nauman observed on the Grodio podcast, this could have packed down the dirt more than usual and helped create smoother, faster terrain. On race day, there was no precipitation and riders were treated to mostly fast, dry roads with light winds. According to Weather Underground, winds were three to nine miles an hour max, but stayed closer to three for most of the event. Temps were about 61 degrees at the race start, 77 when the men's leaders finished, and 79 when the women started crossing the line. The average humidity was around 80%, so it was still a bit muggy. I checked on temperature data for many of the riders' Garmin's and Wahoo's as well. They vary in accuracy, but paint a similar picture with max temps hitting mid to upper 80s and averages in the mid 70s. The morning was overcast and riders were shaded from the heat for much of the race. This year saw the top 61 male racers finish in sub 10 hours. In terms of speed, Lachlan and Chad averaged over 22 miles an hour, and the top 67 elite males, as well as the top two amateurs, all averaged over 20 miles an hour for 200 miles. And the top nine women were also jamming along at an average speed of 19.4 miles an hour, and they did it without interference or help from the dudes. There was a separate start for the elite females this year, 15 minutes after the elite men, and 25 minutes before the amateurs. So without any muddy hike bike sections to allow the age groupers to catch up and interfere, the top ladies truly got to battle each other and were forced to work with each other for that matter in their own peloton, in their own race, which made for an awesome racing dynamic and it was super fun to watch. There has been talk of a rule that'll ban females from drafting off of males, but that never came to fruition at this year's Unbound. We'll see how that progresses in the future. Since my channel is heavily devoted to bikepacking and self-supported riding and racing, and since right before I went to film this, I saw his power data, I wanna give a quick shout to Seb Brewer, the winner of the men's XL350 race. He threw down a winning time of 20 hours, 5 minutes, and 36 seconds, and he beat out last year's winner, Logan Casper, by a mere 2 seconds after 20 hours of riding. Logan's a great dude who I know from JP's Fat Pursuit over the last few years, so crazy props to him as well. According to Garmin, Seb kept up a normalized power of 243 watts over 20 hours, and it cost him a whopping 14,714 kilojoules to do this. He held an average heart rate of 129, only had 26 minutes of downtime throughout his whole ride, and consumed 99% of his calories through gels alone. Let that all sink in because I am cooked after parsing through all the data and info and stories and content I could muster up on the 2024 Unbound. I really enjoy making these types of videos, so let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more of them, and if so, what events or riders or FKTs you would like me to dissect. Also, if you have any questions or insight to add to the mix, don't be shy. And if you haven't already, hit the like button, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and share this video with all your nerdy cycling addict friends on Facebook and all that jazz. I'm gonna go decompress with a nice long bike ride, so until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward. Thanks so much for squeezing dirty teeth into your busy schedule. Please help us reach more people and ensure you receive new videos by giving this video a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell. Until next time, ride bikes, give back, pay it forward.